to these videos on miraculous portraits, the science of letters, alchemy and magic, we are going to discuss yet another aspect of things that transcend our daily material perception. Have you ever wondered whether what you dreamt last night had any meaning? If so, you might be interested to know that many traditional cultures see dreams as bearing meaningful messages. The art of interpreting a dream's message, and particularly of using dreams as a means of divination, is called oneromancy, a word derived from the Greek oneros, dream, and mantea, divination. In the present unit, we will consider some perspectives on dream interpretation from Buddhist Tibet. We will particularly focus on the way dreams are used to determine a practitioner's progress in meditation. As mentioned by Jean-Marie Ferbourten in a previous video, Buddhism is a religion that goes back to the founding figure of Siddhartha Gautama, also known as Shakyamuni or simply as the Buddha, Awakened One. He lived in northern India probably during the 5th century BCE. Buddhism spread to numerous Asian countries and ended up disappearing in India, the land of its birth. Among the different forms of Buddhism, let us mention the Theravada, an early Buddhist school which remains alive to this day, as well as the Mahayana, a current of thought emphasizing universal compassion and the liberating insight of emptiness. The Mahayana ethos might be said to crystallize in the figure of the Bodhisattva, a being who, over a period of numerous lives, is heroically committed to attaining enlightenment for the sake of all sentient beings. There are numerous varieties of Mahayana, ranging from Zen to Pure Land Buddhism, and to Vajrayana, or Tantric Buddhism. The latter became particularly widespread in Tibet, where it was first introduced in the 8th century CE. As mentioned by Jean-Marie Ferbourten, the aim of the Buddhist path is to lead to the complete cessation of suffering. This path is a middle way between sensual overindulgence and extreme asceticism and involves the three trainings of ethical discipline, meditative concentration and sapience or insight into the way things are. Meditation is thus an important spiritual practice in Buddhism, although Contrary to popular opinion, it is far from the case that all Buddhists meditate. Moreover, there are numerous ways of meditating which depend on the particular tradition of Buddhism one is considering. For example, Japanese Zazen is quite different, at least on surface observation, from the tantric meditations practiced in Tibet. Despite the great variety of its forms, the aims of Buddhist meditation are fairly consistent across the spectrum of Buddhist traditions and might be said to be twofold. On the one hand, to bring about a stabilization of the mind resulting from a degree of disengagement from the habitual thought processes with which one usually identifies. On the other hand, the mind's increased stability and flexibility make it possible for the meditator to sustain a profound insight into the nature of reality. This insight refers to the understanding that the entity is taken as irreducible reals, notably what we call the self, are in fact conglomerates that have no independent status and only exist due to the momentary coming together of particular causes and conditions. This second sapiential dimension of meditation is significant since from a Buddhist perspective one of the root causes of suffering lies in ignorance, a mismatch between the mind's conceptual projections and the true nature of reality. The regular and diligent practice of meditation is supposed to bring about a transformation of the mind or, as some Buddhist traditions might prefer to call it, the recovery of a deeper dimension of the mind that has always remained unstained by the adventitious glitches that usually obscure it. This process of transformation and recovery is said to be accompanied by a number of signs, notably psychophysical changes as well as dream omens and even miraculous portents, all of which are held to indicate progress on the path of meditation. In the chapter on dream interpretation, Arya Svapna Nirdesha, in the voluminous Ratnakuta Sutra, dated between the 4th and 7th centuries CE, this progress is measured by assigning specific dreams to each of the ten stages of a bodhisattva. For example, if one dreams that one sees an image of the Buddha, 
This signifies that one will realize one of the first five of these stages, depending on whether one sees oneself presenting offerings, joining one's palms, singing praises, prostrating before it or circumambulating it. Some dreams leave little doubt as to their interpretation. Receiving a prophecy from the Buddha concerning one's own future enlightenment is considered a very favorable sign. Other dreams are more ambiguous. Dreaming that the Buddha is teaching but that one is unable to hear his exposition is a sign that one has despised his doctrine in the past and that one must compensate for this misdeed by assiduously listening to Buddhist teachings. Some apparently negative dreams take on a surprisingly positive meaning. To dream of eating scorpions and snakes signifies the accomplishments of one's wishes. A similar sense is attributed, less surprisingly, to dreaming of building Buddhist reliquaries called stupas. Yet other dreams can present differing interpretations depending on the spiritual condition of the dreamer. To dream that one goes to hell is a very bad sign for a hunter, who in the Buddhist context is held to be burdened with a negative action of willfully taking life, but presents no such problem for an advanced meditator for whom hell itself is an illusory appearance. A further point to note is that even bad dreams indicating negative portents can be transformed by means of presenting offerings or through the performance of other rituals. More advanced meditators can, through the practice of dream yoga, learn to retain awareness even as they fall asleep, and thereby come to recognize that they are dreaming without this causing them to wake up. It then becomes possible to actively influence one's dreams in order, for instance, to accomplish spiritual activities during one's sleep. The ultimate purpose of practicing dream yoga is to dissolve one's tendency to grasp towards and mentally solidify reality. Gradually, the meditator comes to view both daytime and dreamtime appearances as illusory and dreamlike. Appearances are not rejected or blocked out, but integrated to one's contemplative experience as the magical projection of the mind's innate luminosity. Not all dreams are deemed equally significant in determining a meditator's progress. In fact, a qualitative distinction is usually made between three kinds of dreams which are associated with different parts of the night. Dreams occurring during the first watch of the night are connected to one's karmic imprints. This means that they are influenced by the various deep-seated tensions connected to one's habitual reactions to recent or distant events. Dreams occurring around midnight are caused by the afflictions that plague one's mind the main ones being stupidity, hatred and desire. These dreams are also sometimes said to be caused by demons. Dreams occurring at dawn are dreams of clarity. They can give a true indication of one's present state of spiritual maturity as well as of events that are yet to come. It is these dreams alone that merit interpretation as vectors of meditative progress. Apart from dreams, there are other, more external signs that can occur as the practitioner's meditation develops. Some of these signs are psychophysical changes, such as being without hunger or sleepiness for prolonged periods and having very clear sense faculties. One may also develop a sense of bodily lightness and feel as though one were flying through the sky. Visions of Buddhas are also said to occur, as are miraculous abilities, such as the faculty of transforming earth into gold or of speaking various non-human languages. Whatever the extent of these various signs, the meditator is warned not to take them too seriously. The great 10th century master Nupchen Sangye Yeshe writes repeatedly in his Samten Migdran that hoping for such signs is a fault that hinders one's progress as it generates attachment and pride. Ultimately, whether such indications manifest or not is of little consequence. What is necessary is for the practitioner to continue his meditation undeterred without being distracted by expectation. If the practitioner meditates properly, whatever signs occur are allowed to manifest as the dazzling yet dreamlike display of the mind's intrinsic luminosity, 
without falling into the trap of investing them with an importance they do not have. So as you can see, dreams can be very significant. In the next and last video of this week, we will see a specifically Japanese way of dealing with nature and the supernatural, with predictions and clairvoyance, and other things that concern humankind and the world around us.